This is the Forgotten Ways Podcast, the show where we explore what it looks like to both love God and honor the earth. Join me, Brandon Scott Elrod, in fun interviews with friends who are clergy, philosophers, politicians, business owners, and regular folks like you and me, who are all learning and growing in both our faith and our environmental stewardship. All right, welcome back, everybody. We are joined once again by our good friend, Doug Brown. Doug is an amazing guy, very smart, wears glasses that make him look even smarter. <laughs> um, Doug is the uh, founder of a nonprofit called Uniquely Knitted. And Doug, give us a two-minute uh, elevator pitch for Uniquely Knitted. Yes, absolutely. Um, we work with couples who are struggling through infertility. So we created a nonprofit to sell infertility gifts so that people could do more than say, I'm so sorry to someone who they know, but they could actually give them a gift uh, or purchase something for themselves. But more than that, we create mental wellness programs. So while you're going through infertility, whether a treatment or just struggling to get pregnant, uh, you have an opportunity to prepare your mind and build a community around you so you can kind of journey through the whole process together instead of trying to brave the whole thing alone because mm-hmm. it can be incredibly stressful yeah. um, and, a, and a big strain on your relationship and really hard on you. So we want people to go through the whole thing in community. And we, we do that in a lot of different ways. It's really fun. And it sounds like you have, this is something near and dear to you. Um, you have some personal connection here? Absolutely, yeah. My wife and I struggled to get pregnant for years. Um, we, we ended up doing lots of costly treatments that never ended up working out. So we moved on from that, and we are now adoptive and foster parents. We, mm-hmm. are, we have two kids living with us right now. Uh, one of them is adopted. So it's it's huge for us. We, we The only way we were able to grow and move forward in our infertility was by the community that we had. And so we're very passionate about helping people not go through this in isolation, but Mm -hmm. go through it in community. We think it can be a a fork in the road sometimes for you. You know, a lot of people end up um, getting pregnant, but some people don't. And there's a lot of different options for you all throughout the way. Um, And it can be too much to take on just by yourself. So we're fighting for people to to build that community Mm -hmm. and teaching them how to do that. Wow. That's that's a major uh, unmet need uh, yeah. in culture, isn't it? it? It absolutely is. Infertility is still one of those taboo topics um, that, that's just hard to talk about around the dinner table. Not mm-hmm. a lot of people like to bring it up. It feels sad, um, but it's incredibly common. One in eight uh, people will struggle to get pregnant. Um, and 60% of the people who go through it don't ever even talk about it. They kind of just, oh, you know, we're not trying. Right. Um, they'd rather just kind of, yeah, bury it. So it's incredibly common and people aren't talking about it. Yeah. So we're advocating advocating for the conversation to go forward. Wow. Well, fantastic. Doug, we always love having you. Love your perspective and your thoughts. Uh, Doug has a, a background in, in ministry. He has a background in philosophy. And so today we're talking about a really interesting uh, kind of out-of-the-box topic that might make some people a little uncomfortable. I don't know. (laughs) I'm excited. Uh, I'm excited too. Uh, We're talking about this idea of the personhood of plants. Right. So (laughs) can we just say in the beginning, it starts to fit. It feels weird on the, on, on the beginning of it, but I think there's a lot of really great stuff here. So it feels weird at the onset and it gets weirder or it gets (laughs) more, more sane. So uh, as as you may know, uh, I've I've spent you know, 25 years working with trees. Specifically, I'm a certified arborist. Uh, I was a horticulture major in college, so my background is very uh, plant nerd background, botany and plant physiology, plant pathology, uh, you name it. Um, but trees, I, I just have a special fondness for trees, and I've worked with them in an urban setting for uh, for a few decades now. Um, in the past year, uh, a couple years, there have been some uh, some research presented by a couple people in particular. One is Suzanne Samard, who did a TED Talk on... Um, on her research when it comes to trees, and she's got decades of forest research um, and tons of white papers out there available for for a review. And then uh, another gentleman by the name of Peter Wolleben, who is a German forester who uh, kind of 
doubled with Suzanne uh, and her research and put out a book called The Hidden Life of Trees. And um, in both of those settings, the book and her TED Talk, uh, they, they talked about this, this notion of trees and their ability to do some really amazing things in the context of community, in the context of a network or or a system that supports itself. Hmm. And um, where in the urban sense, I deal with trees that are disconnected and introduced, and they are a collective of individuals in a natural setting in the forest, um, as God designed these these systems, um, they are very uh, symbiotic and they are very supportive. And that's what their research really dives into. And in their research, they have kind of identified some traits that might be surprising to a lot of us, um, a few of which are that trees in this uh, forest community can um, can communicate hmm. with each other. They send messages uh, through their root system. Uh, they can self-determine in the sense that when another tree is, uh, especially when it's a child tree, you know, a tree that is um, originated from a parent tree, as as it would infer, um, that they're able to uh, reallocate resources and send resources to their offspring that are in duress um, or under insect attack or or something. And another trait that they uh, tied into the previous one, that they can sense pain. They can, um, I would put in quotes, feel pain. Obviously, trees and plants don't have brains, but they do have nervous systems of sorts. And so we have a few traits here, the ability to communicate, the the ability to self-determine, and the the ability to feel pain. Not not the way you think about trees. Sorry to interrupt. I mean, not not at all. And not at all the way you think of trees. And I I, I grew up in an urban setting, and much of what you describe sounds more it sounds more like animal life, you know, than it maybe what I would think, you know. Uh, uh, wolf to uh, the the wolf pup or whatever the dog to caring for the the puppy and all that kind of stuff. It sounds more like you're describing animal life than you even are describing plant life because right. I, I see you know a tree in the sidewalk you know planted there kind of like a potted plant almost. Mm-hmm. Um, but that's amazing. That's absolutely amazing. So yeah, one of their points is that this occurs, but we can't see it. Mm. It occurs, but we can't hear it. Uh, because it's happening at a frequency that the human ear cannot pick up. It's happening subterranean, right? It's yeah. it's below ground in the root yeah. system, or it's below the bark in the tree, you know, physiology in the vascular system of the tree. Right. Um, it is happening, perhaps, at a rate that is so slow. Yeah, that even if we could see it, we wouldn't recognize that something was happening. Yeah, that's what I think. You know, I, you know, I obviously have plant life all around me and, and where I live, and you do see over time trees, you know, moving towards the sunlight, things like that. But it, I, I wonder how much of the time aspect of it, it, it just goes. We don't, we don't even notice it. I mean, right. we could talk about our busy lives and our world, but just our the human understanding of the world is a quicker understanding than the way I'm sure a tree you know goes through sure. the world sure and, and well and even factoring in tree longevity and how yeah. much longer a tree lifespan is than our <laughs> right. own right yeah so so we we today are kind of tackling this interesting notion of the personhood of plants uh, as it relates to uh, some of these characteristics that we've just talked about um Now, there's a researcher, it doesn't matter whether you agree or not, uh, or value this person's background, a leading expert in this area that has had some influence over the past few decades uh, is a person named Marianne Warren, and her influence um, is is kind of far-reaching. Her criteria of personhood uh, consists of these six things. Uh, One, uh, consciousness of objects and events external and or internal to the being, and in particular, the capacity to feel pain. Number two, reasoning, the developed capacity to solve new and relatively complex problems. 
Number three, self-motivated activity. Activity which is relatively independent of either genetic or direct external control. Number four, the capacity to communicate, by whatever means, messages of an indefinite variety of types, that is, not just with an indefinite number of possible contents, but on indefinitely many possible topics. Five, the presence of self-concepts and self-awareness, either individual or racial or both. And the last one, moral agency, the capacity to regulate one's own actions by thinking about moral principles or ideals. So this person who has a, a voice in this area and culture, that is their factors that they've identified. Now, Doug, you have from a, a philosophy, you know, yeah. philosophy background, you yeah. have a different um, or, or further yeah. uh, understanding of, of personhood as a concept. Absolutely, yeah. We, you know, in philosophy, you don't want to break things down into really big categories. Mm-hmm. Um, and, you know, there's a lot of different thought on all these topics, but maybe a, a good way to kind of break it down in the beginning for us from the phil- philosoph- philosophical side is what things are alive and what things are not alive. You okay. know, you could think of are they rocks or are they people? Are they living things or are they non living things? And a good way for, for us to break it down even from there are what are some of the categories that would categorize something as living? And those things for us would be, are they intaking uh, food and disposing of waste, mm-hmm. you know, much like us, you know, right. eating breakfast in the morning and then you know, going to the bathroom in the afternoon or something. Are they, are we, is there a system of, of, of nutrition yeah. going through us? And then on top of it, are we able to reproduce? Are we creating life out of us? Like mm-hmm. do, do we as living things or do we as things have the ability to reproduce what we what we're doing? And then on top of that, are we growing? Like, are we stagnant in what we're doing or are we constantly growing for us humans physically growing taller, but even more than that, like as our skin reproducing or our nails growing, those would be things uh, that are hallmarks of living things, mm-hmm. which pretty, pretty quickly you kind of can jump into uh, hu- human life animal life and plant mm-hmm. life are all seem to have those, those three hallmarks of living things. Mm-hmm. Trees are growing, they're reproducing, they're, you know, producing waste, all mm-hmm. that type of stuff. Um, so it's easy for us to make that jump to say a rock isn't doing that. A rock isn't growing. Mm-hmm. It's not reproducing. Um, and it's not, it's not intaking anything or disposing of anything. Um, but clearly a tree is. Yeah. So for us then, Personhood has, starts to get weird. We can jump more into this, but yeah. what what, thi- what what makes um, uh, that living thing different than the non living thing? Besides those those three that we just talked about, is there something more to those living things besides just those three attributes? And I think that's where the personhood starts to come in, which is which which now gets weird and interesting. But I think it, it you start to have to attribute something to these living things more than just the attributes of, of living. Mm-hmm. There is this idea that there is something beyond just what you see. There's a personhood aspect to it. Yeah. Okay. So if we're looking at and kind of merging maybe both of those lists, Marianne yeah. Warren and this philosophical perspective, um, that's about nine traits. And, yeah. and just right off the top, it looks like, Easily, we could say that trees fulfill six of those. Yeah. Right? They are growing. They are reproducing. They are consuming and creating waste. Yeah. So that's three. Um, they they do communicate with each other based on this research. They, they at whatever level, they, yeah. s- they sense pain. Yep. They sense when a branch is broken, when an animal starts feeding on them, when an insect feeds on them, yeah. and they respond differently and they process each of those inputs differently. Yeah. It's not the identical reaction to a person snapping off a twig mm. compared to a deer saliva touching and consuming and an insect. Like Those are all three physiological different responses. Mm. Okay. That's fascinating. <laughs> it is. It's it really, really is amazing. amazing. Yeah. Um, and how it, it re uh, attributes resources and reallocates yeah. resources and releases. Uh, there, there's one example of, of acacias in Africa where um, as gira- giraffes start to feed on them, that they, the acacia sends out a signal and the surrounding trees that have not yet been fed on yeah. will release a, um, I can't remember if it was tannins or, or what substance that they'll yeah. actually release and flood into their leaves to make their leaves taste unappealing to the giraffes. Oh, wow. 
And so the giraffes in response <laughs> tend to feed upwind where <laughs> the breeze hasn't been able to blow this yeah. you know, signal. Wow. Or they'll jump like 100 feet and they won't even touch the trees around because they're just bypassing the ones that are going to taste bad. Yeah. Wow. It's a remarkable system. It's remarkable, yeah. But all, all things considered... Um, the ability to communicate, the ability to feel pain, the ability to self-determine as they reallocate and, and make some of those responses. Uh, maybe we can't call them decisions necessarily. Yeah. Maybe, maybe not. But responses. So those are six criteria right there that fit the personhood measure. Mm-hmm. So is that weird? <laughs> Is that weird? Like when when we take the nerd hat it off, it feels weird, and we a just go bit. back to like <laughs> church guys. Yeah, <laughs> is that weird? Yeah, I mean, it doesn't make sense. And again, I, I want to run it through the the lens of, you know, I'm an urban dweller. You know, mm-hmm. I don't. I'm not. You know, even in the context of where we live, I live in a very urban context. Yeah, um, but it doesn't make it doesn't match up with the way I experience everyday life. I think that's what I would think. Is when I look at the trees, when I go climb a tree with my son, when I walk on the grass, I, I'm not thinking of my surroundings in this way. Mm-hmm. The way I would think of, you know, if I were to see a dog, I have a very, I have a certain type of reaction. Right. When I see a tree, I don't have that same type of reaction. I don't know if that's some of the things we've talked about, the slowness of the change, you know, the unseen nature of it, mm-hmm. or just the cultural conditioning that this isn't the way to view plant life. So, I mean, at some level, and I realize this research is really new, the conclusions that are being drawn are, are really new at this point in time, but I, I, mm-hmm. in this regard, and maybe kind of having to reframe how I, I look at things a little bit, if, um, if I'm going to be assigning personhood to something like, like trees and nature, um, I, I think even for a lot of us, even assigning personhood to, to animals yeah. is still a stretch. Yeah. Because what I think I bump up against is, oh, so does that mean I'm a person, but now the tree's a person? So, right. <laughs> right. so if I was created from a biblical perspective to rule well, to be a good steward of creation, um, but I'm the same as it, like, what is that? What, how do I relate with it? Right. Um, that, that, that takes a little bit of processing for me. Yeah. Um, is that putting plant life and trees on the same plane? As we would say, like human life or? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, dignity of life, quality of life, value of life. Mm. What we have in consciousness from an evolutionary perspective is something that supervenes, would be kind of emerges out of the complexity of our biological nature. Okay. Um, starting from a very non-complex biological being that you get this mind, which is so complex that out of its complexities come consciousness, Okay. Um, which was a, is a whole other podcast. Uh, sure. but, but from our perspective, what we're saying is that the mind influences our body. Our thoughts are in our mind and our mind is in our soul. So the soul is something that isn't this thing that's kind of emerged or evolved out of the bio- biology that is um, exists outside of our body, but also within, in our body, in that it fills our body completely, and that the body can live with the soul, and the soul can live without the body, but the body cannot live without the soul, if that makes sense. Sure, so, super simple. It's super simple, right? But um, but the soul being that personhood thing, that, that thing that is like over and beyond what we see, you know, on the street and in the everyday life, if you see a person, there's something that makes that person whole and makes that person more than just what you see there. Let me give you an example. And I think there's going to be an an interesting correlation now to animal life and plant life. Let let me give you the example is, um, you know, I'm sitting here, my name is Doug. Um, and if you know, I I have, my body is here, Mm -hmm. holy present. My soul is here present. And you would say that my physical makeup, um, is me and my soul is the thing that, you know, embodies me. Right. Mm -hmm. 
Um, but if we were to go back to the other way of thinking and say, I am only my physical makeup, right? I am only just my biological material that you see here. It would make sense that if, you know, in some freak universe, my fingers got cut off on my left hand, you know, the wall collapses, fingers get chopped off. I am no longer the same biological being that I was before my fingers got cut off. You know, I'm now fingerless Doug, right? (laughs) Um, But if you're saying, if you're thinking that, um, we are just physical beings now, I'm really, I'm a new, I'm a new being because I now exist without that, that those aspects of my physical makeup that previously defined you that pre at some pre- level. Exactly. Like if, if the entirety of my being made up me, if I lose any part of that, I'm in a way a new being. And it kind of seems ridiculous to say, no, you're just the same thing, but without fingers. Mm -hmm. But if we are only a collection of all of our parts, and that is what we are, as soon as we lose a part, a new definition must be created, and we are now a new thing. You can think of it like a car driving down the road. A car driving down the road loses a wheel, and if a car is made up completely of its its parts and it loses that wheel, mm-hmm. in a way that car is not the same thing anymore, right? It's like, and now it doesn't have a wheel. But a person, you chop my fingers off, you would want to say, no, that's still Doug, but he just lost his fingers. Okay. So the correlation is, and the, the what we can draw out of that, is there's something about me that makes me me, regardless if I have my fingers or not. Okay. So, I mean, you could say I could chop my arm off. It's like, well, it's still Doug, mm-hmm. but he just doesn't have an arm. Mm-hmm. So there's something going on here where I am more than my arm. I'm more than, you right. know, if you took off my, my, you know, if we just got weird and you started kind of pulling me apart as a human... I'm still me, regardless of how many pieces you take off of me, right? Mm -hmm. To a point where even if I were to die and my body were to cease to exist, you would still say, well, there's still Doug. He just is without, you know, he's not here right now. His body is not here right now. So let's talk about trees, right? Mm -hmm. So you have a tree. This is happening to trees all the time. And then you could give us examples of it, of they're losing their leaves, right? Right now it's, we're heading into a time of spring season, right? But, you know, if you think about the fall, trees are losing their Mm -hmm. leaves. I have a tree in my backyard. It loses its leaves. I don't look at that tree in fall and say, well, look at this new tree. Where did it come from? It's obvious to me that it's the same tree. So there's something about that tree that keeps it being that tree, regardless if it loses its leaves or it loses its limb. But to push back on that. Yeah. I think one could say that as long as the process or characteristic is part of its design, its inherent design, okay. then that that's kind of not valid. Like, okay. like it's it's supposed to do that. It's right. part of the design. What if instead we're talking about um, a massive branch breaking there, there off? There you go. Yeah, that probably is a better example. Yeah. So then... Or maybe me, me personally, I go and chop that branch off. Uh-huh. You know, like it wasn't even a natural process. Right. I get my chainsaw out and you know chop off a giant branch. Have I created? You know, have I created a new tree? Right. I would say no. I would say I've chopped a branch off of this tree. Mm-hmm. So the tree is more than just a collection of all of its leaves, bark, and and you know, material, Yeah, there is something that we want to call personhood. I would say soul. There's something there that we would say there's the soul of the tree that makes, it's the thing that defines the tree beyond the collection of its parts. Could that be uh, also referred to as the intrinsic value? I think so. I think that's where you're going to find your intrinsic value. Okay. The intrinsic value is going to be housed in a way in the fact that there is something there that makes up this tree that's not just a collection of its parts which is interesting in the way that we interact with trees and interact with plant life animal life and human life is that if there is something that is uh that we can say about them that's not just a collection of their parts well now we have something that's it's non-material it's kind of in this this world of where you would find intrinsic value, um, per- preserved nature over time, right? Mm-hmm. The same tree at, at one inch as it's sprouting is the same tree that's, you know, the giant sequoia, right? Okay. They're, they're, they're the same tree, vastly different material and mm-hmm. look and a feel and size and, and all of that. 
But when we approach it, there, there has to be something that's true about it that is keeping it that same tree all along the way. And that's what I would say. Now you get this weird sentence, trees have souls. <laughs> yeah, that, that's, that is a, a paradigm shift for sure. Yeah. Um, okay, so trees have personhood based on the measure of what we've been talking about. Correct. Um, We're making the connection now then that that can lead to the statement that trees have souls. Um, How, if if that is accurate, then is that the same thing as a human soul? Uh, Same value, same contribution, same all that? Or how would you delineate that? Yeah, I think... It's pretty obvious that it, I, w- I would say that trees do not have the same type of soul as humans have. Um, but there, it is true that there is something that makes them who they are beyond their physical makeup. But yes, a human soul is different from a, a dog soul as different you know, from a, a sequoia soul. But it's that, that they exist and there's certain attributes of each one. The main distinction between plant life, animal life, and human life, I would argue... Is our ability to is our ability of to have consciousness at the level that we have it, um, and the main thing I would say about that, and the hallmark of that, is that we have thoughts that are sensory. We sense pain, you know, we sense mm-hmm. uh, fear and all these things. But beyond that, we have a second order of thoughts. There's our original the the, the, the sensory intake thoughts, mm-hmm. but now we have thoughts about our thoughts. You know, we have a sense of fear or a sense of pain, but we also have a thought about that thought, mm-hmm. right? You know, sure. if, you, if you poke me, I have the sensory thought of, oh, I feel pain, but I also have the thought of why, <laughs> why did you do that? Yeah. I have a thought about my pain. I'm happy about my pain. I'm sad about my pain. I think that would be the main distinction between plant and animal life is that there are the sensory pains, sensory thoughts in a way that trees and animals have, but there's not that second order of thoughts of the tree isn't, um, it's, it's in pain, but it's not, oh, it's not thinking about its pain. Yeah. That, that would be my, my distinction. Well, and I would say from a human perspective, and I don't know if this is fits the clinical model, but mm-hmm. I would make the leap that you could have third order and beyond mm. of thoughts where now you have a history or a pattern of pain yeah. Okay. That yeah. you can process and unpack and yeah. resolve, and you know, th- so there's multiple layers that clearly animals and and plant life are not even remotely capable of. Right. Yeah. I, and I I would agree with that. Yep. So, so then does that start to get into the territory of spirit versus soul? Mm-hmm. I don't know if you mm-hmm. if you're a tripartite uh, body soul spirit <laughs> or bipartite uh, yeah. body soul. <laughs> But, um, yeah, there is that qualitative yeah. difference then yeah. that we are asserting and maintaining on behalf of humanity. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. I, my view of, of the spirit is that the spirit is a capacity of the soul. Um, and that in our humans, for humans, for us, what that looks like is our spirit is is a capacity of the soul that we have. And it's the tool that we use to interact with the spiritual world. So if, if, if there are capacities within a soul, you know, the mind being a capacity of the soul, um, and all these sorts of things, the mind is the tool that I use to interact with the logical world. My spirit being a capacity of my soul is the tool that I use to interact with the spiritual world. And I think that is that, that way of thinking capacities holds true for animals and for plant life and that trees would have certain different capacities. And I think a, you know, a spirit could be a a type of capacity. I I don't know of enough about that, honestly, but could be a type of capacity of the tree's soul. Um, a mind, it wouldn't be one, I don't think, but but a a spirit could be one, you know, something that, yeah. Cause there's no, there's no brain. There's no, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but it, it, that brings up a whole, litany of questions, doesn't it, to me? I mean, it, it, first of all, we're talking about trees way different than I had ever thought of growing no, up. Sure, me too. Um, but when we're talking about souls having this this everlasting type of thing, um, 
the souls don't necessarily just go away. You know, they're, mm-hmm. they're hard to get rid of mm. because you can chop the thing all up, but it's, there's something still there. Mm-hmm. Um, so there's something, and if we, if we were to make a total Christian move or a spiritual move, mm-hmm. um, and all of us are, all of this is existing in God, then there's like this spiritual connection between God and trees and, 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 and plant life and all, and all of us existing together. So and it's like this cohesive system that starts to fit together, which is way different than what the average, <laughs> what I thought, sure, I don't really think sure. of myself, but I didn't think of it like this. Sure. And, and that would certainly fit, um, conceptually with this idea of, of God as architect, God as yes. engineer, God as yeah. designer, God as intentional and in putting his intention into not only the creative process and creating the world, creating uh, life, but also in his, um, uh, his plans and accommodations for the sustenance of it, the order of it, which is what we were tasked with as, right. as people to order this system. Yeah. Um, and... So is it really a leap to think that God maintains connection at an unseen level mm-hmm. with the very system he designed to operate in such precision and such harmony? To me, that, that just makes sense. Absolutely. Of yeah. course he cares. Of yeah. course he's intimately involved. Of course he sustains life. Um, of course his spirit brings life. So how does that happen? This may be... I part think, of that vehicle. I think this is the way you get to living things is you have to have a living God. Right. And I think that's, that's the connection there is that if we are all sparks of electricity and, you know, just biological makeup, which that's the way to describe it all. And that's all, it is all true. But if there's not something over and beyond, I, I have a hard time to get into life, to mm-hmm. get into mm-hmm. living things, um, yeah. beyond if, if you can't talk about personhood, if you can't talk about souls, if you can't talk about the thing that makes me, me, that's not part, you can't point to it, but it's, it's me. Mm-hmm. I have a hard time getting to life mm-hmm. beyond maybe, you know, maybe like bacteria or something like that. That might, that right. would be the only thing you could see to me, the, the complexity that we see in, in all of life, is po- it just greatly points to a, a greater complexity of, of God. So, I mean, what I'm hearing in this is really the only way basically saying that this isn't that weird of an idea. It's that not crazy. Yeah. It's totally sane. I think the only way that we can get to personhood, intrinsic value, mm-hmm. intentional design, the only way we can make that leap is if we believe in a creator God. Yeah. 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 This can't just happen accidentally. Yeah. Um, and I think if you, if you want to know more about that, and if, if, this, if, this is, if this idea is making you angry or it's making you intrigued, <laughs> I think the, 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 it's a big conversation, but where to look is the idea of consciousness. You know, you could start there mm-hmm. with human consciousness. Where does it come from? I use the word supervenience, and I, and I think that would be a good starting point, just, you know, looking that up and starting to figure that out. Out of the complexity of our biology, does consciousness emerge or is the complexities of our biology made sense of by something like a soul? Mm-hmm. And I think that that's you have to start to figure that out. And there's arguments in either direction. But to argue that out of our complexities, we have we have, you know, the mind supervening on it. Um, coming out of it and and being there, it's and that's that's hard to believe too. I mean, mm-hmm. consciousness is hard to make sense of, no matter what, even plant life and animal life. The fact that trees are growing towards light, all these things that you said, I mean, that's hard to make sense of. It, you know, yeah. it, it's it, it's not what we think of when we think of trees and rock. We think it's all just kind of you know, for lack of a better word, dumb. But it's yeah. it's not. I mean, it's there. The evidence is there. Even empirically, that's something really complex and almost supernatural is going on. I, I would agree with that. Yeah. I would absolutely agree. So my question then, in is maybe some practical application. Yes. Um, in in my line of work, we see uh, unfortunately we see, see some bad work. We see mm-hmm. some trees that have some really terrible things done to them. And we know from a 
technical perspective, from a scientific perspective, that what was done, and so like one of the common ones is topping. Topping where you yes. just indiscriminately cut branches off at random places along the, 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 the limb and just leave stubs everywhere. Right. Um, that's bad. Right. That's bad. At a, at a basic level, that's bad. At a more complicated level, it's actually changing the structure of the tree and creating um, decay entry points. It's creating mm-hmm. resulting growth that is weakly attached and easily breaks out, yeah. causing further damage to the tree, creating liability yeah. for property you know, tenants and, right. and the public. Right. So there's a... There's a damaging, there's like a permanent damaging yeah. that is occurring to the tree. So from a personhood perspective, when these kinds of things are are done, um, how is that affecting personhood? Mm-hmm. How is that, um, what is, what's the, the takeaway? What's the ultimate negative value there? Is that something that... Um, is now something worse or something more serious yeah. than if it were just inert matter that we were yeah. hacking away at? Yeah, yeah. What are your thoughts on that? Uh, it's fascinating. Um, I think at some level we probably ought to start carrying our the way that we think about people and animals to plant life, to, to trees, and we ought to start moving some of those thoughts down the line mm-hmm. to where I don't think anyone would think that it's right to just – Indiscri- like you said, indiscriminately just beat up a you know a dog or a cat you know fight sure. a dog just kind of whip it around like that. Well, people get arrested for you that. You get arrested for yeah. it. I mean, it's, it actually is illegal. Yeah. And, it, and at some level, it doesn't feel right, you right. know. And I think that it, now you introduce a moral aspect to it, where it mm-hmm. just doesn't feel right to do that to an animal. It, it degrades the person doing it, the yeah. animal that you're doing it to, and just yeah. you know, and every person that that and other animal that 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 animal comes in contact with is now kind of marred by your mistreatment of it. Mm-hmm. We don't think about plant like a plant no. life like that at all. No. You know, no, we it's don't. not, not even a little bit. Mm-hmm. So I'm not, I don't know if I'm wanting to say, you know, we need to, you know, cutting down a tree is immoral. Maybe I might be willing to go there. I don't know. Yeah. But, but I think we at least ought to carry over some of that thinking that you can, you know, immorally treat a tree and that you can, you can, like you said, harm it and harm its growth and harm all the people after it, there should be a sense of I'm doing something wrong, you know, yeah. in that, even in, in our conversations of what we've gone g- going through, I notice even in the way we teach our children, right. Mm-hmm. You know, our kids will see, you know, the trees where we live and things like that. And they'll, they'll goof around on them and, you know, or they'll try to pull branches down. I've, I've totally, approached it differently and like that's not right don't do that you know <laughs> you wouldn't want someone to do that to you and your arms why yeah. are you doing that to a tree and then you know my kids think i'm like crazy or something like why it's just a tree and i'm like okay we are culturally conditioned that trees just they don't matter like they're just inert objects mm-hmm. so i think it's probably time to start kicking some of our thinking about people and animals down the line to these other category of living things, of yeah. plants. I know some folks that are talking about sort of the, maybe they're not using the word morality, but mm-hmm. but they're kind of applying that same filter to um, specifically uh, trees. Yeah. Uh, trees that were uh, in, in, you know, a naturally occurring forest, mm-hmm. um, something like that. Something that here in the U.S. was originally, the national f- uh, forest was designated uh, and protected to preserve and con- conserve lumber supply. Yeah. Um, so, if that is the main value that we've been running with, then you can use it. And as long as you're aligned with that original purpose, then you're you're in line. Right. But if we're if we're coming at it, and some of the folks that are looking at it nowadays from that kind of moral position of, I think. You know, 100, 150 years ago, this this push to you know fell the the biggest yeah. sequoia you can, and it yeah, took yeah. you know thirteen men uh, eight weeks to to right. bring this tree down, but they conquered it. Right. And what was what was the inherent value? The takeaway: there were much smaller trees that they could have had yeah. much easier. Yeah. That produced paper and timber product. Like, why didn't they just go for that? Right. So, is there something? And I think wastefulness mm-hmm. is part of that that moral 
yeah. question yeah. when it comes to something like trees. Like, yeah. was this necessary? Right. Um, what was the lowest common denominator that we could have engaged with, used um, for our purposes? Right. I'm not saying you can't use nature. That's how nature works. It yeah. consumes itself. Um, even looking at the food web and things like that, it, that's there is a trickle down there. Right. But how we choose and what we choose, I, I think, may play into that that moral question of were we just consuming for consuming sake or was this only take what you need? Yeah. And to me, morality introduces exactly what you're saying, a sense of obligation. Anytime you bring up morality and and there's a sense of ought, you know, whether Mm. whether it be the intrinsic nature of human rights, you know, that we ought not discriminate someone based on something like skin color. Right. There is a there's a oughtness to it. There's Mm -hmm. an obligation to not do that because Mm -hmm. it would be immoral. Right. If we were to think about it like that, and and you start to bring in the idea of yeah, chopping down, you know, felling the biggest sequoia there is, there is a sense of we ought to respect nature in that way, mm-hmm. which I think you know changes the conversation. It's not like a hey, this would be a good thing to keep in mind. It's a, a sense of obligation is introduced now that we are obligated to treat our surroundings are the nature that we find ourselves in, in a certain way, mm-hmm. which for us, cha- you know, for me even changes, you know, I, it changes the way I approach the whole thing. It's not a habit I'm trying to change. It's a, well now I have an obligation to do it, which is a, it's a heavier, heavier burden to bear. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that, that would imply some change on our behalf. Yeah. Change in how we engage with things, change in how we, um, Honor things. I, I love this term that I, I came across. Uh, I don't, I don't know who originated, but but the dignity of creation. Yeah, I really like that. I think that informs um, perspective and decision making. And it, you don't have to make a theological swing uh, one way or another. You you don't have to even buy into this notion of personhood. Yeah, uh, if it's too much right now, you know. Yeah. <laughs> but the dignity of creation. Yeah. Like, if we believe that our God made this and that he's actively invested into it, then yeah. yeah why, why wouldn't we treat it with some dignity? And, and that's, that's pretty broad. Like you totally. could, you could yeah. take that any number of directions, Absolutely. how to, how to show dignity. Yeah. You know? So yeah, there's a clear line there uh, to me of there, you know, living things are created, living things are in a different category. There, there's something about them is special, and they are so complex and so created to be so complex that dignity, um, a sense of ownership ought to be added to them. I mean, that's that's a pretty – that's a direct line I, I see that um, changes the way we view nature. Yeah. So it's interesting that a lot of this research – I mean, this is done in a very natural setting in a, in a original old-growth old forest. Mm-hmm. They don't find the same – uh, root network and um, community elements in an urban setting. Yeah. Um, so a a question for me to process moving forward would be, how does does personhood apply then in that setting? It reminds me a little bit of you know Tolkien and and mm-hmm. C.S. Lewis, the distinction between those those animals and trees that could talk, yeah. and those that couldn't. Yeah. <laughs> right. Yeah. Like there was a shift. Those are two different things. Yeah. And in a <laughs> surprisingly uh, similar sense. I think we find that between the systems that God has designed and orchestrated yeah, to be interdependent and rely on each other versus the systems that we architect and implement, you know, a, a, a master planned community and we build a park and we put right. trees in front of every house that doesn't behave the same way that a forest does. Yeah. So, I, I, it makes me wonder what personhood <laughs> looks like in that right, context. Right, which is probably applicable to all sorts of things. You know, what we do with animals, with people. Mm. When when we when we order them, there is a sense of disorder in our in our ordering. <laughs> right. You know, it's not it's not community based enough. Yeah. It's not natural enough. Um, 
And yeah. that's, that's it. That's fascinating. You know, the, the old, like you said, the old growth forest where everything is inter, intertwined mm-hmm. and, and connected. We ought to be more, we ought to be allowing that and creating spaces for that more than, you know, having things be perfectly, what we think perfectly designed right. actually ends up, you know, isolating people. It makes me think, um, even about sometimes the way we think about our culture in general is that we we're, we are very seg- you know segregated mm-hmm. and very isolated you know even in the way we live and, and all of that you know the way we drive in you know, Southern California driving cars there is a sense of we're in community but very isolated yeah. and you know it's very sterile so of course we would order things that way yeah <laughs> exactly right <laughs> just what we know so we would put all of our trees in pots and make sure they're you know far enough away yeah. and things like that <laughs> yeah totally. Well, some of the takeaways today would be uh, this notion that I think we could say trees have souls. Yeah. Trees have personhood, uh, plant life as God designed it in community, in context in particular, has intrinsic value, which would put the soul word on it. Um, It has personhood, but it it does not have humanity. Right. And that that's okay. Both can exist. Yeah, absolutely. Both can exist. And both can exist only in the context of having a loving, creative God to spark that and design that to operate that way in the first place, to assign that intrinsic value in the first place. Yes. Uh, yeah, absolutely. It's the thing that makes sense of everything that we see. Yeah. Yeah. It's not just, you know, the complexities of all the, the life aspect of it isn't just emerging, you know, out of it. Mm-hmm. The, the consciousness of humanity, the soul of the tree, um, the thing that binds it all together, regardless if it loses its parts or not, it, you know, that didn't just pop out from its biology. Right. It was assigned to it. Right. Yeah. And that is inherently worth more. Exactly. Yeah. Wow. Okay. Well, that's that's some some interesting conversation. I, yeah, there. we've that's a big jump we've made. I, I yeah. think it makes us even like you know you, you walk outside, you drive, you think, you look at the, the trees, the over you. There's a different sense of connect, almost connection to it. Um, and that's yeah. that's a cool that's a cool thing. If you if you really bring this in, bring this in and internalize what we're talking about, I think you go through your day different. I I would agree with that. Yeah. How, how could you not? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Well, thanks everybody for joining us. Um, that was fun. That was a fun conversation. Thanks, yeah. Doug, for joining us. Thanks for us having again. me. Yep. And uh, we'll see you on the next one. See ya. You've been listening to the Forgotten Ways podcast with Brandon Scott Elrod. To find out more, visit forgottenways.org. Join us next time as we once again explore what it can look like to love God and respect the earth, beginning with our own heads, hearts, and homes.